What's up, family? Welcome back to Struggle Session. I am Leslie Lee the Third. Today we have a very special, mega-sized two-part show. First up, we have Brian Solomon, writer of Blood and Fire, the unbelievable real-life story of wrestling's original Sheik. He's here to talk about the late, great Terry Funk. If you don't know about Terry Funk, this is a show to learn. We have a fascinating discussion about him. Of course, Terry Funk was a wrestler, but also an actor. You can see him in Roadhouse, Over the Top, or the NWA, ECW, Memphis. He's been all over. As your Paul, your Paul know who Terry Funk is. This conversation is mandatory listening. You'll be able to talk with your Paul about Terry Funk after this. But for people who are looking for a deep dive into wrestling, over on the bonus half, which you can get at sesh.show by subscribing to our Patreon or our Substack or to our Supercast feed, which is just a direct RSS feed. On that bonus half, I'll be joined by Jay Baker of The Left Fist. They'll be on to discuss some deep, deep wrestling goss. CM Punk fired by AEW, or did he quit? The returns of John Cena and The Rock to the WWE that just so happens to coincide with the SAG strike. Once again, to get the whole show, make sure to subscribe at sesh.show, Patreon, Substack, Supercast. Or, if you're facing financial difficulty, which a lot of people are, just send me an email to strugglesession at gmail.com. We'll hook you up. That's also the place to send the voicemails. Let us know what you think of the show. Make sure to like, subscribe, leave reviews, tell a friend. I hope you enjoyed our Baldur's Gate episode. Chris and I had a really great discussion. Since then, I've played quite a bit more of the game. If you're playing, feel free to hit me up on Steam. Uh, You can find me actually the same address, sesh.show, sesh.show on Steam. Same address as the website, sesh.show. Search down Steam, find me, add me. We'll play some Baldur's Gate together, but fair, fair warning. I'm playing by the John Brown rule, okay? That means any slavers we meet gotta die. If we're co-oping, I'm killing all the slavers. No questions asked. Might mess up your run. Just just fair warning, you know, because I noticed that in Faerun... They really do believe is heritage, not hate. It's a part of the culture of a lot of the races to have slavery. I, I ain't down with that. Anyway, thank you all so much for your support, for your subscriptions, for sharing the show, for telling your friends about it. Really appreciate it. You hear Spike there. He appreciates it too. Hey, Spike, you decided to talk about Terry Funk and CM Punk? Yeah, you are. All right, folks. On with the show. Yes, I heard after that match with Lawler. Sure, I'm missing some teeth. Yes, I've got permanent damage to my eye. But have you seen Jerry Lawler? Has anybody seen him? Does he have enough guts to come back against me again? I am the meanest man in professional wrestling. They had to pull me off a lawyer while I was beating on the man's body while he was laying there. This week, they're going to have a fence around the ring. And you people remember what I'm saying to you because I'm speaking the truth. You will never 
see Jerry Lawler wrestle again. So if you want to be there for his retirement match, well, make sure you come down there because I'm going to take the man and I'm going to hurt him so bad that he will not be able to wrestle again. If I have to, I'll break one leg. If he gets up and hops to me, I'll break the other leg. If he comes crawling on his belly, I'll kick him in the head. Believe me, Jerry Lawler is going to pay and he's going to pay dearly for what he did to me. Hey, I love my family, and my family loves me. My brother loves me, but I have no respect for anybody like Lawler. I have a definite hatred for the man, and I'm going to take that sickness out of my mind. So, Brian, tell me about this crazy bastard from Amarillo, Texas. Well, that, that really is the... A great way to describe him, and it's so very true. You know, the reason people are have been praising him so much, especially in the wrestling community since he passed, is that he really was one of those old school guys who completely committed to what he was doing, to making you believe in what he was doing. And that meant really convincing the world that he was about as insane as it gets. And this enabled him to really become a phenomenon in wrestling to continually reinvent himself, to be relevant in all different eras. You know, he was like this force of nature, and he's he's got a career that spans from the mid-60s, really, I mean, full-time into the mid-2000s, and he still kind of lingered on a little bit until about 2017 when he, when he literally couldn't do it anymore. And And like I said, part of that was the commitment. I mean, he came from a time period where wrestlers really protected – the business. They had their code of secrecy, which was called kayfabe, which was the idea that you don't want your paying customers to fully know the nature of what they're watching. You know, they may not think it's 100% real, but you don't want to rub it in their faces. You want to allow them to suspend disbelief. And Terry Funk was really the perfect performer in that regard. If you watch anything he does, the man never blinks. And I think that's what people love about him most is the commitment to his craft. Yeah, I've been going back and watching uh, some Terry, Terry Funk stuff. And even like like you said, he started in 1960. You can't even see like a lot of his old matches. You have to read about him. But I just watched his uh, first uh, NWA uh, title win in 1975. And, and uh, that looks like it's filmed on like 8mm. Yeah. And he gives a promo after it where you know the presentation is very much like a sports event, right? At, the, at that time, wrestling was. But he injected this... Even though they were asked, the the commentators were playing it very straight and asked him, you know, what about this world title match? I see that, you know, the referee was down uh, at a certain point and counted you and it would have been a five count if you would have gotten pinned if the referee wasn't down. But you still but you ended up uh, winning the match. And he his response was just like, I don't recall that that didn't happen. And it's so funny because even at that early early stage back in the he had this weird crazy personality that we see blossom uh in the 80s 90s and like you said he kept reinventing himself and getting crazier and crazier you know i'm glad you mentioned that title win and the promos after it you know there's another one too that they did with jack briscoe who's the guy that he beat for the title because in those early uh, in those early years of his career he did play it a little more straight i mean when he was coming up in amarillo texas working for his father's promotion out there in West Texas, he did kind of play the wild cowboy even back then. He was they, he was known as the king of the chain match. But to the wrestling world at large, and especially in those days when you're competing for the world title, it was actually taken very seriously. And you had to play it a little more seriously. You couldn't really be an obvious character. But it's, a very, it's very impressive that Terry Funk, even at that level, now he's become the heavyweight champion of the world, 10 years into his career, and he still manages, like you say, to inject some entertainment value in this very sports-like presentation that the NWA world title was known for, and especially the, the Florida territory where he won it was very sports-like, and he gives you this, it's not over the top, it's not completely unhinged Terry Funk like you'd get later, but he gives you this taste of his quirky, oddball personality you know you can see he's the bad guy 
but in a in a subtle way, not in a very over the top ridiculous kind of way. So this just goes to show that he could do it all. That's what people loved about him. He could he could play it at volume level one, volume level five if you wanted. He could go up to ten. He could blow up the speakers. You know, whatever you needed him to do, he could do it. He is, and he can do it like all in the same like span. He goes from whispering to screaming. He has like like a the Ryan people talk about the Ryan Gosling scream, this really sort of high pitched scream that he has in a lot of his movies, even his like serious drama. And and Terry Funk does that same thing where he just has lets out this bellow, this whining bellow. Like um, I'm thinking of the Empty Arena match uh, nice. with Jerry Lawler, which. Folks, even if you've never watched a single minute of wrestling in your life, this is this is one of the matches uh, to watch, folks. Because and not to spoil it for you, but at the end, his eye is uh, injured off of some uh, some contrivance where he had a weapon and he ends up stabbing himself in the eye with it, um, and he just bellows and screams like a child uh, for like like he's almost begging for his mother he's begging his opponent jerry lawler to help him and it's just like the most sh- one of the most shocking like feels it feels so strange and real uh this obviously you know if you look at it closely kind of this ridiculous thing but he just sold it so well and he made you believe that my god he had just had his eye put out Right. You know, people ask me a lot of times what's the best thing I've ever seen in wrestling, you know, because I've been watching wrestling for almost 40 years now. And I've I'm kind of a student of the history of it. So I've watched tons and tons of much older footage. And I more often than not, I will say that the the greatest thing I've ever seen is that empty arena match, Jerry Lawler and Terry Funk. And it you know, I saw it after the fact. I, I was not really a fan when it happened. I was a very young child, and I, I didn't grow up in the Memphis area, which is where it happened and where it was on TV. But years later, through the wonder of you know VHS tape and things like that, I discovered it, and it is – it really – first of all, it's so different from the mainstream kind of WWF Hulk Hogan wrestling that was big at the time. It is um, – it's really – it's a completely different animal. And it blew me away. And really, this is no offense to Jerry Lawler, who's terrific, but it all comes down to Terry Funk. I mean, he made that. And if I can explain a little more about it, I, I don't want to dwell too much oh, on please. it. please. What's amazing to me about it, and you hinted a little at it, is just the insane emotional roller coaster of Terry Funk. Because the idea of the match, for people to understand, is uh, Terry Funk and – Jerry Lawler had this feud that was so hot, this rivalry. They hated each other so much, you know, that the idea was, you know what? I don't even need to be paid for this. I am going to destroy you. I don't even need an audience to be there. I don't need paying customers. Let's go down to the arena whenever you're free in the middle of the day with nobody there. And I will kick your ass in the ring. All we, you know, all we want is a camera because I want there to be a record of it. I want people to see what I do to you, but I do not even need to have a paying audience. So Terry comes in and he's all braggadocious and he's cursing left and right. <laughs> and, you know, it's all getting bleeped out. You know, I have seen the unedited footage and it's amazing. And you've got the Memphis, the best part is you've got the Memphis announcer, Lance Russell, who is there to kind of call it. And Lance Russell was like the voice of reason in this insane promotion. And he almost acted like the father of all the, and the wrestlers were all like the bad children. And he was always scolding them. So he so now Terry Funk is cursing and yelling at Lance Russell. Terry uh, Jerry Lawler is late to the arena and Terry is bragging what he's going to do to him. And then a few minutes into the match, Terry Funk grabs off. I think it's like a broken piece of wood, like a jagged piece of wood from a sign. He tries to stab Lawler in the eye with it. And of course, like all great wrestling villains, he winds up getting it instead. And when Lawler kind of gives it, of course, it's wrestling, so he's not, thank God, actually stabbing him in the eye. But when they do the spot where he supposedly stabs Terry in the eye, his emotions immediately change. Like you say, he sounds like a child who got spanked. He's panicking. He's crying. He's actually crying. He's begging for help. He's begging Lance Russell. He's apologizing to Lawler. He's begging Lawler. But then the best part of his whole shtick is that, As soon as Lawler starts to walk away in disgust, his demeanor immediately changes. He stops being apologetic. 
and he starts yelling and cursing at Lawler as he's crying, <laughs> calling Lawler a coward, calling him yellow, screaming at him, you know, raging against the void. <laughs> and it's this incredible, believable, emotional ride that he takes you on. And it's like, if you want to know Terry Funk, you watch that thing and it gives you everything you need to know about what made him great. Yeah, I remember the first time I saw Terry Funk. And I'll never forget it because uh, my mom called me into the room to watch it. And my mom isn't like a wrestling fan, but she's, you know, from the South, from Louisiana, familiar with it. She uh, used to live next uh, door to JYD. Uh, unfortunately, she doesn't have any good stories, but she used to live next door to him. Uh, and I, she called me in the room to go to watch this wrestling show that I hadn't seen before. And it was WCW. And what was happening was they were replaying the time that Terry Funk pile drove Ric Flair through a table on the outside of the ring. And they were acting like, oh, my God, he had murdered Ric Flair. Like Ric Flair would never walk again, never wrestle again. They were mentioning like the the plane crash that Ric Flair was in. Uh, he was in a plane crash in like 1975, but they made it sound like it had just happened like six months ago. And his neck was still like hurt from that. Like, I never forget it because that was my first time seeing, you know, WCW wrestling on TV. My dad took me to a show uh, when I was very young, but I had only seen like WWF superstars. And like you said, that was like a cartoon compared to WCW and what, especially what Terry Funk was doing in that feud with uh, Ric Flair, which is generally considered one of the best feuds in uh, all of wrestling history. Yeah. And the crazy thing about it was, you know, that was 1989 when that happened. And Terry Funk at that point, was in his mid-40s. He'd been wrestling for almost 25 years. So he was kind of considered a little bit over the hill. And in fact, his catchphrase or the way he described himself at that time was middle-aged and crazy. And, you know, looking back on it now, it's ridiculous because he still was going to go on wrestling for uh, another 10, 15 years. And not only that, but doing some of the stuff that he would even be best remembered by from younger fans like the ECW stuff and then when he went back to the WWF and the Attitude Era. But, you know, the the flair feud in WCW was wild because he had kind of a little bit fallen off the radar. A lot of fans hadn't seen him in a while. He had had a brief run in the WWF in the mid-80s when they were really hot. And then all of a sudden now, a couple of years later, he shows up in WCW, and he's like, um, he's, he's just supposed to be a ringside judge. They have him sitting there, you know, with other luminaries of wrestling, these kind of like, you know, old timers. And he's, you're, you're set up to think, oh, this is Terry Funk and his dotage. He's just going to be judging this match. You know, Ric Flair beats Ricky Steamboat. He gets the world title back. And Flair comes in the, I'm sorry, Funk comes in the ring to congratulate Ric Flair and the congratulations turn into a friendly challenge. And when Flair kind of politely says, no, I'm not going to I'm not going to give you a title shot, Terry. We, we haven't even seen you in years. You have to earn a title shot. You know, Terry Funk goes ballistic. He goes from just being I'm the smiling, you know, retired legend. I'm here to congratulate you. He goes from that to I'm going to try to kill you on television. And, and the table, like you said, he pile drives him. In the table, and you have to remember, this was at a time when you did not see a lot of that on wrestling TV. Like you know, it's because of Terry Funk and other people that wrestling nowadays you can barely even watch a wrestling event that doesn't have somebody going through a yes. table on it <laughs> multiple times. But I have to stress to you, and I really mean this: um, people that watched back then know what I mean. You really never saw that back then. Never. I mean, like never especially in, in major league high level wrestling. You might see it, you know, maybe like once a year, some crazy storyline they would do. So when he did that to Flair, it really was very shocking for a lot of people. And he does it the first time and the table doesn't break, which is actually even worse yeah. because, you know, you, you know, you imagine his neck is taking all the impact and then he does it again and the table breaks. And, you know, just like that, Terry Funk is like back on the map on major league national wrestling television. One of the things they talk about in the few, one of the reasons Flair says people, Terry, you got to wait your turn 
is Terry Funk spent a bit of time in Hollywood. And I'm sure a lot of Struggle Session listeners know we did an episode about Roadhouse. He's big into that. Uh, he was uh, he, One of his earliest films was uh, a film that no one talks about now uh, for, for somewhat good reason. It's called Paradise Alley, uh, written and directed by Sylvester Stallone. It was a movie about three Italian-American brothers navigating uh, professional wrestling. So if this... He, if this film had taken off, like rock instead of Rocky, it could have been a bunch of movies about professional res, uh, wrestling uh, over the years. But Terry Funk was in that, and he and Sly really hit it off. Like they became really good friends. Sly brought him back for um, Over the Top. He's uh, he's in that, and then of course that led you know to things like Roadhouse. And he's just uh, Terry Funk as as an actor, just as an actor is very very good i've always enjoyed i've enjoyed all of his performances and i wish he actually had done a bit more uh, of that uh, because he went fairly hardcore into hardcore wrestling uh in the in the mid 90s but i wish he had done more acting yeah and i think what's important to remember about that because this is a detail that i think gets overlooked and forgotten when it comes to terry funk and acting is that there was a time especially around the time of of Paradise Alley, like you said, which is 1977, uh, right after Rocky, I think. I think Sylvester Stallone jumped into that right after Rocky. And, you know, for the years after that, into the late 70s, early 80s, mid 80s, Terry Funk was very seriously trying to become an actor. Like he really did. He kind of wanted to go the route of like what Hulk Hogan had done, where the movies can become, can almost take the place of wrestling in a way. You know, The Rock has learned that lesson. He makes, you know, 10 times the money for for one-tenth of the work, and there's nothing wrong with that. And Terry, there was a moment where it looked like he could do that, and it never quite happened for him, you know, for a number of complicated reasons. I think he was a little disappointed about that. But, you know, he got a lot of praise for Paradise Alley. He plays Frankie the the Thumper, who is like, he's the goon for, for the bad guys. You know, he's like their enforcer. And I think the problem with that movie, because it, no, it's not a very good movie, is it tries to treat wrestling like it's real. Yes. And I don't think that audiences were willing to accept that. Like, it's not as straight up dramatic as Rocky. Like, it has more elements of comedy to it. But it wants you to believe that the matches are legitimate, which, which is a big logical leap for viewers. And that's partly why I don't think the movie worked. And so... You know, he was able that the friendship with Stallone was a major boon to him. It was a real advantage in his life because even though he never became kind of an acting a megastar in Hollywood, through his connections with Stallone, he was able to keep working. Like you said, he wasn't over the top. He a lot of people may not know this, but he worked with Stallone doing fight choreography on some of Stallone. Like I know uh, Rocky Five in particular, the movie where. Sylvester Stallone, basically, Rocky has a street fight in the street. There's no boxing. He has a street fight with the boxer Tommy Morrison, who plays Tommy the Machine Gun in that movie. And Terry Funk choreographed their street fight. Um, he's You can look it up. He's in the credits. And Stallone, like, for example, when, when Stallone did Rocky Three and he was looking for a wrestler to face, to have Rocky face, um, Terry Funk was the guy that hooked him up with Hulk Hogan. I mean, he gave him a few options, but he highly recommended Hogan and he helped. I mean, goes without saying that was the defining moment of Hulk Hogan's career. There would be no Hulkamania phenomenon. There would be no Hulk Hogan as we know him today without him appearing in that movie. And then also W and in that regard, WWE as well with no Hulkamania, maybe like we're looking at a completely different WWE. And I, I do want to admit it's a good place to talk a little bit about the economics here, because one of the things that uh, was very famous about Terry Funk's acting career is that it allowed him to get health care through his membership in SAG, which wrestlers do not get. And I've watched a few interviews with him in late stages of his career. A lot of time, and when people say, tell him, oh, you're so great, you're so wonderful, you're one of the greatest wrestlers of all time, his, his response is often something like, okay, then why didn't I make more money? <laughs> and he talks about how, you know, the WWE and WCW 
like constant like would not call him until like it was the last resort, you know, because he said, I didn't like, I wanted to do my thing. I want to protect my character. I didn't want to look back. And he like was very, you know, independent minded. And he did his own thing. There's an infamous episode of WWE uh, Shotgun Saturday Night. Well, probably the one of the best episodes of it where he just goes off and starts calling like McMahon out by his name and talking shit about him and talking shit about the announcer. He's just doing his own wild thing, which doesn't which never really fit with the corporate model of wrestling that uh in and up becoming in the in the late 90s and if i remember right um correct me if i'm wrong uh, i haven't seen that in a long time i don't think they aired most of what he did because that show was was not live and i think they cut out a lot of the the most provocative stuff it's almost like they they wanted to make sure he didn't get over to a level or, or he didn't get across to the fans and become, you know, at a level higher than where they wanted him to be. Yeah, because when you when you watch, uh, encourage people to go watch it, it's like it's so much more different and real than anything else. Even Stone, Stone Cold is the one he's kind of battling with uh, from right. from ringside. And you see that Stone Cold Steve Austin is outmatched by Terry Funk because Terry Funk can do anything. He can play the badass, but he can also play like, like the coward too, the, the chicken shit who's scared of a fight as well. Like he can do it all, absolutely anything uh, you asked of him, but he always wanted to kind of do his own thing. And it is great that he did movies and TV. Uh, by the way, he's also in a great episode of Quantum Leap, the time travel series from the 90s, where he essentially plays a character who is based on his father, the wrestler Dory Funk Sr., you know, because you have your main character on Quantum Leap who travels back in time to like, I guess it's supposed to be like the 50s, you know, which was like his dad's heyday as a wrestler, 50s and 60s. But, you know, what I'm trying to say is that, that the benefit, like you said, of him doing that work and why a lot of wrestlers try to get at least a little bit of it in is you get into the Screen Actors Guild and you get those benefits. And let me tell you, Terry needed those benefits late in his life. And thank God he did that because he did have a lot of health issues later on. And I'm, I'm sure that having the SAG health benefits really did help with that. And yeah, you know, the times that I spoke to him and briefly being around him, you do, you did get the sense that I wouldn't call him bitter because he really was a joyful person. He really was a humorous kind of guy, but you could tell that there was a little bit of that sense of, I should have, I should have been bigger. I should have made more. I should have been, you know, why couldn't I have been at the level of like a Hulk Hogan? Why was I not allowed to get to that level? Um, I at least did get a sense of that kind of ruefulness. You know, there's a thing. It's almost story. like heartbreak, almost like a heartbreak. Yeah, I a little bit, a little bit of heartbreak, you know, because like sometimes he would bring up Hogan in conversations just because I think it was on his mind, especially when you consider the fact that he helped launch Hogan in that way. You know, there's a famous anecdote. I don't know if your listeners would know, but there, there was a, a, a singer in the 50s and 60s named Billy Eckstein. And he was African-American, which at that time, you know, was limiting to his career uh, if he wanted to have a wide American audience, a widespread audience. And but he was known in the business as having the greatest voice, the greatest talent, better than anybody. And he had a decent career, but he wasn't a megastar. And somebody said to him in an interview once, if you know, if it's true that he thought that he was a better singer than Frank Sinatra. And he said, you know what? Sinatra could have my talent if I could have his money. <laughs> and and I think that that sums up the Terry Funk Hulk Hogan dynamic to me. Like, yes, Terry Funk, no one would argue against. I don't even think Hogan would dispute that Terry Funk is the much better all around performer. Maybe there was never anyone better. He's on the short list. But, you know, he'd give all that away if he could have attained the star level of somebody like a Hulk Hogan who was able to use the gifts that he did have, which may have been limited, to parlay it into, with the perfect opportunities, into, um, you know, immortality, uh, the, the, the hugest star the business ever uh, produced in some ways. 
Well, Brian, I kept you long enough, but thank you so much uh, for joining us today on Struggle Session, talking about the Funkster. Folks, I have to recommend you go out and I'll include some links to some of the stuff we talked about, but you got to watch some, at least some of the promos, at least watch him chase around Jim Cornette around the ring, which is one of the funniest videos that is on, on the internet, period. Is the f- Are you a sissy? <laughs> Oh my God! But Brian, before we go, please tell me about you. You re- you put out a new book. Please tell my listeners about it. I think they'd be very interested. Sure. Uh, well, you mean the newest one? Yeah. Uh, the newest book that I have out is not uh, wrestling related. I know some of the work that I do is in the wrestling media, but my newest book is about another great love of mine, which is comic books and superheroes. And the title of the book is Superheroes: The History of a Pop Culture Phenomenon from Ant Man to Zorro. And it really is exactly what that description of it is. It's meant to be a reference book for everything that you ever want to know about superheroes. And and not just in comic books, you know, predating comics, the whole idea of superheroes in our culture right up to the present day with all the movies and TV that we see today. And, uh, yeah, it's available now uh, across anywhere you buy books, you can find it. And if they don't have it, ask them to order it. All right, Brian, where can people find you? Well, I'm on Twitter and Instagram at Brian R. Solomon, and my podcast, if I can mention it, is called Shut Up and Wrestle with Brian R. Solomon, and, and it's on all the podcast platforms. In fact, one, one of my, my most recent episode is uh, um, an interview I did with Terry from a few years ago and kind of just talking about him and his legacy. Y'all are at fault? Fuck you. If you're not, I apologize. But what did I ever do? in this world to go to deserve an empty headed fucking dumb fuck like hangman adam page to go out on national television and fucking go into business for himself for what what did i do dave what did i ever do didn't do a goddamn thing what's your name sir fuck the pittsburgh penguins what are you doing man what are you doing I made it really clear in Forbes, and I just want to make it clear again. Nick, It's not his position to make it very fucking clear. There's people who call themselves EVPs that should have fucking known better. This shit was none of their business. I understand sticking up for your fucking friends. I fucking get it. I stuck up for that guy more than anybody, okay? I paid his bills until I didn't, and it was my decision not to. Like what you hear? Get some more at patreon.com slash struggle session or sesh.plus or struggle session.substack.com. Thank you so much for all your support over the years. We really appreciate it.